But yeah, if I take a look at um, how everything is interconnected, the wars that we're having, yeah, the geopolitical standoffs, um, it's all about resources. It's all about energy. Yeah, it's all about fighting for having this top one position in the whole energy value chain. You know, we're talking about oil. We're talking about access to information. We're talking about access to data. <laughs> Pascal Morgan is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Pascal is a technology pioneer, creative thinker, passionate speaker, and cross-industry digital transformation advisor. As the founder of Think, Speak, Transform, he looks back at over 30 years in IT, technology, media, and innovation as executive and strategist for Fortune 500 companies and industry leaders such as Coca-Cola, Deutsche Telekom, AOL, and Pixel Park. He is a member of the faculty at Future IO Institute, a good friend, and we're also on that faculty together at Future IO Institute. Um, uh, for Emerging Technologies, a senior mentor at German Tech, business coach for startups, co-founder of the company Builder United Peers, and previous board member of the European Technology Chamber and chairman of their Acad Academy Commission. Driven by exploring, connecting, and researching on transformation, disruptive technologies, and new business models, global societal challenges for a sustainable future. With a love for coffee, gadgets, and especially people, I'd like to welcome my friend Pascal Morgan and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being on. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me. And, uh, and thanks for that uh, kind and warm welcome. I feel very humbled. And um, I have to say in the very beginning, there are a thousand people out there that are a thousand times smarter than me. And that's why I feel very honored to have that conversation with you, Mark. You know, I'm a big fan of yours, of your work. And uh, we've been connected now for several years now. And, uh, and yeah, I, I almost your, 2015 your or a little bit more, uh, uh, somewhere yeah. around there, I think. Yeah. So our path is, paths have crossed over the years for sure. So, I mean, it's, it's an honor to be there. We've worked on many projects together, many books, uh, many master classes together. Um, so I'm glad we finally have the time. We've wanted to connect uh, all the time. We're just, both of our schedules are so busy. It just never happens. So we're going to make this a uh, podcast, uh, kind of a, a reconnection and let people get a deeper dive uh, into you, your transformation, and what what you do. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm not sure, but you correct me if I'm wrong, if Think, Speak, Transform was around when we first met. And uh, if it wasn't, or if it was in the making, I kind of want you to tell us a little bit about that, how it's come to life, and, and what you do with it. And uh, why did you choose that? And and uh, give us a little update on where you're at, what's going on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, and a very good question, because it actually touches back on where I come from and also my roots. So I think when we met, I think it was in the transition phase. I was still in corporate at my last corporate gig as uh, CIO Germany and IT Innovation Director Europe for the Coca-Cola company. And uh, I was in a transition of moving out and I was asking myself, you know, what do I stand for? What is my brand? What do I want to do? What is my legacy? And uh, and it was really interesting. I worked together with a very, very good coach um, and, and friend of mine uh, at the time trying to find out what really motivates me. What is my intrinsic motivation? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And, uh, and I remember, I mean, I started my career around 30 years ago um, within IT and digital. And at the time, I actually was 
studying philosophy in Frankfurt um, here in Germany, actually, you know, Adorno, Habermas, I mean, those are the big, you know, the modern day philosophers. And I remember the Philosophical Institute in the Dante Straße um, next to the Goethe University in Bockenheim uh, in Frankfurt. So I was studying philosophy. I was an artist. Um, I studied dance and choreography uh, parallel to my school and my university studies. And I thought I was going to be an artist, an artist and a thinker and um, really, you know, absorbing society, absorbing all the impulses, processing that, metabolizing that and bringing out artistic um, output. Um, and, and I was working at the Frankfurt Book Fair as a student because I have to finance myself because as a choreographer and dancer, you don't really earn that much money. Um, we were part of the founding companies, dance companies in Frankfurt for the Musantum. Um, at the time was actually the first big off theater uh, space um, in the area. And we're very proud of that. It was uh, the Freies uh, Tanztheater Frankfurt uh, together with the Vivian Newport uh, company. I know this is going a little bit more into a different direction now, but it was still referring back to my roots. I mean, what motivated me? And uh, and I will, we'll talk about that in a, in a second because that's very important to me. What does it mean? Personal resilience and personal transformation and also purpose, um, which is a very, very personal answer for everybody of us, right? So going back, um, I was working as a student at the Frankfurt Book Fair to, to finance my university studies and to finance my art. And I was working at the postal department. And uh, we're talking at the beginning of the 90s. And the postal department then talking about GDPR and data privacy. I mean, I had to open every letter uh, at the as a student worker, opened every letter and took a look. Was this, was this addressed to the right department? Was this addressed to the right person? I have to make photocopies, uh, put it on a stamp with the date, you know, when it came in this letter. And I put it into these compartments and then, you know, twice a day, I would collect all the mail and all the parcels that arrived in the boxes. And I would then go through the whole Frankfurt Book Fair. This was called the Ausstellungs- und Messe GmbH des Börsenvereins des Deutschen Buchhandels um, and would deliver the mail. Now, after like working for a year there, you get to know everybody. You get to know all the departments, the international departments, the publishing rights departments, the ones that interface um, uh, the publishing houses and so forth. You get into conversations, you understand how the company works, the processes, you get really a deep dive into the whole publishing industry, into the whole media industry, you get exposed to all of that. And I had an idea one day. Um, actually, I really didn't have this idea. I just got into a conversation with the book fair director uh, because his secretary was out. So I brought him the mail personally. And I was just telling him, I think your IT sucks. <laughs> so at the time, the IT department wasn't very evolved. Everything was outsourced. There were a couple of um, external uh, advisors coming in and helping the book fair. And I just said, well, I think some people in some departments, um, they're aching. Um, they're not connected. Uh, there's no core database and all these kind of things. I felt the competency to say something because at home I had an Atari and I was using the Atari to produce some of the music for my dance <laughs> events. So I have felt the competency to speak up. Um, and that's this funny thing with, you know, uh, sender and recipient. Um, and I, it took several years, many years later to really understand what happened in that moment because um, I think what he really said was, Pascal, come back at a later time. I really don't have time for you right now. And we'll talk about it. But what I heard was, Pascal, great idea. Think about it. Come back to me with a, with a concept and we'll, we'll discuss. So two months later, I delivered a 30-page concept, a document with my proposal on how to set up a new network infrastructure, how to integrate the IBM AS400 and uh, um, 36 uh, mid and mainframe computers, how to actually you know, reestablish a whole company network, um, also to attach an external department over a wide area network and everything. And uh, he looked at it 
he said, Pascal, I have to get this checked by somebody externally to see if this is actually legit. And a week later, he called me and said, Pascal, do you want to do it? So, I mean, this is a lot of fun. Sounds like a lot of fun. And you're grinning the whole time. But just to be serious, do you really want to do it? And I said, yes. And uh, everything else is history from then on. Uh, so I broke my heart because I stopped my my dance and my choreography and my artistic part. Um, I also even stopped uh, my philosophy studies and I became the um, the head of IT and new media product development because it was also on my table then to produce the first book fair CD-ROM and also to launch the very first book fair website. That was 1993-1994. And uh, yeah, I was then the lead of the Frankfurt Book Fair IT for five years. And that's how my whole IT and digital career started 30 years ago. And yeah, that's a bit to my to my story. So to answer your question, Think, Speak, Transform. So when I left Coca-Cola, uh, and don't get me wrong, it was a very, very good experience. Um, great professionals, great colleagues, very interesting brand. I mean, they hire the best brand and marketing people you can find in the market. So for me, it was a very intense learning. But at the same time, I was always conflicted with these questions of it's a company making a product the world doesn't need, but everybody wants. And the question around sustainability, around purpose, in this whole field, I'm very thankful and grateful for working at this company, but it also made me refocus and re-question uh, some of the things that drive me personally. And uh, they have a very extensive CSR program which um, you know, at the time it was five by 20 uh, or the eco center, for instance, getting like 1500 ship containers retrofitted with, uh, with drilling mechanisms. So send that out to sub-Sahara Africa into rural areas uh, and you know, give them a way to, to drill into the ground and get, get water supply, get fresh water supply. These kind of programs were a mind opener or at the time the project honesty, which has changed now, unfortunately. Um, they've sold out of it. But when I was at Coca-Cola, this was a, a new way of getting farmers in, local farmers from India um, that um, are um, planting organically, organic tea. Um, and uh, so those kind of programs opened or widened my horizon. But at the end of the day, I asked myself, what do I want to stand for? And that's why I said, okay, well, philosophy, I think. I love speaking. I love communicating. I love connecting with people. Um, yeah, more like, you know, so the Socrates concept of things is um, learning by exchange and by communication and by reflecting. Um, and so speak. And then, of course, my own personal transformation story and also being part of a larger transformational um, movement. And that's why I think, speak, and transform. I love it. I absolutely love it. Thank you for answering that. And I'm glad that you gave us the long form because that's important. We, we want to hear it all, which has opened up uh, many other questions, which are right down the alley of how we normally um, do the podcast. And so um, I'm going to just, we're going to, we're, we've started out slow enough and we're going to go into some, some depth and substance. Um, first and foremost, in case anybody's just asking the question out there. Uh, so you speak uh, wonderful German, your English is excellent. What is your heritage? Where are you from? Uh, uh, how do we understand it? You've got beautiful complexions. So there's there might be some more things in there. I would love to hear that. And then I want to really get into the, the, the more transformation and thought process behind some things. Yeah, um, so, so thanks for that uh, very important question. Um, I mean, our future should not be defined by our past, but our past is the history of our learning and gives us the tools and the capabilities to challenge or to better say face the challenges of the future. So in that sense, I am proud of my heritage. 
Uh, and uh, thanks for asking that because that's been something that has always defined me, has always been a challenge for me as well, to find my way through society, through uh, a mainly um, a society mainly driven by a white majority and uh, always feeling a bit on the outskirts of society as also being in the center of things when it happens with transformation and change. So uh, yeah, my background, my dad is from East St. Louis, East St. Louis, Illinois, uh, and uh, very proud African-American heritage. Uh, actually just coming back from the US from the family reunion there. We had our family reunion this year in Dallas, Texas. And I'm the lightest complected, more or less, in the family, of the core family. Uh, I think we had like 90 plus um, participants. And um, yes, and it's just wonderful to, to dive back into my African-American heritage and to be at a barbecue, uh, for me, at a vegetarian barbecue. That's a point I have to make. We can talk about uh, food and uh, climate impact um, at our at a later stage. You know, today is Earth Overshoot Day. So, um, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but long story short, uh, yes. So looking back at 400 years of slavery, looking back at um, abduction of tribes, of people, of uh, dramatic and very drastic personal stories uh, that we can tell ever since the 1600s, 1700s. And of course, that's the heritage of my name, uh, Pascal Morgan. Uh, Morgan is not a typical African name. I'm not Mbubu or Ekeke or something. It's Morgan. And that name comes from Wales. It's a Welsh name. You also find some Morgans in the northern part of France. Um, uh, so Morga. Uh, but it was the tradition of uh, farmers and plantage owners to uh, give their slaves their surnames. So that's where Morgan comes from. And that is something we have to be aware of in our African-American community is, you know, what has happened to our identity? How have we changed over, over time? And, and where do we, how can we reconnect to our own roots? Yeah. And there are people that go in the direction of Kwanzaa. There are people that go in the direction of Afrofuturism. I love these movements. I learn a lot from that. I try to stay abreast on these on these things on these uh, trends. Um, but that is my that is my story. That's where my complexion comes from. And the other part of the story is my mother. She's from Bad Durkheim. It's a wine area in in Germany. Um, and unfortunately there, the family is very small, very limited, uh, not that much I can leverage. I can just share one sad aspect of it is that her father was um, an officer in the Second World War um, uh, on the side of the Nazis. And uh, after the war, he actually never, um, let's say, he never evolved out of that kind of thinking. Uh, which led to um, quite a divide in our family because he never accepted my African-American father and never accepted me as his grandson. Uh, so in that sense, there was no connection. And that was the beginning of this feeling of something is wrong with me or something is wrong with where I come from. I'm not accepted in, in, in this society. And uh, and my mother, of course, she went through the process. I mean, she did her PhD in history and wrote, or she was a spe specialist on uh, national socialism. So Nazism, the Third Reich, um, you know, every now and then, every few years, I get a call if uh, I still have a copy of her PhD work or of her dissertation that I can share. I still have a whole collection in the basement. Unfortunately, she passed away um, uh, 25 years ago. So, but, you know, there's still a lot happening and that was her process to to get a position from a political perspective so long story short my influence is among the spectrum of an african-american father um with uh, a lot of pride and heritage um on one side but also growing up in a u.s military bubble and on the other side i had this free thinking mom that um, was a feminist and uh, political activist 
And uh, yeah, and I'm still proud to, for instance, um, be a, um, a supporter of a prize of my late mother uh, in her name, the Dr. Dagmar Morgan Prize. So every few years um, in the area of Darmstadt, since she was a political activist in that area, um, that we actually have a prize that awards uh, social projects around women's rights um, and uh, empowering, enabling women in STEM, in business, in work, um, et cetera. So yeah, that's that's a bit a bit my heritage. I love that. Yeah, now, I think not only a, a global citizen, uh, very diverse and much needed. And I'm glad you you brought that up because we want I want to talk about some of it. So it's not only ties to uh, the work that you mentioned that your mother did, which to me, and I don't know if uh, you say you still have your mother's writings and things, but I don't know how familiar you are with Hannah Hannah Arndt and the Eichmann mm -hmm. trials. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's a basically, you know, uh, has some some wonderful works here for those on the audio only podcast. I'm holding up the books, the human condition the Eichmann trials from from Hannah Arndt. So basically a Jewish uh, uh, German Jewish American. I don't know how that exactly works, but also a form of a global global citizen who really spoke about human conditions, about diversity, about horrific things, specifically uh, also very similar that ties into um, to what you just mentioned with with uh, uh, some of the, the, the Nazis and, and some things and uh, just even in, a, in your own family, things that happen. I, I was born in America, but I consider myself a global citizen also kind of grew up in Germany, but have family all over the world. And uh, not a little bit of that diversity as well. Um, and so I think I think that's really important because through through that diversity, through what's going on in our world today, through the big history of our world and the inequalities, this topic of um, of race, of color, of of uh, religion or beliefs are as really, boy, it's just it's coming even more that we haven't solved it. We haven't figured it out. We're, we're still struggling with it today. So I think it's really important, but sometimes, and that's what a lot, what Hannah Arndt spoke about is that um, it's not necessarily always the individuals who are the, the racists or the abusers or the ones doing the harness, but it's these one or two people that kind of set the tone of that's my general, that's my president, that's my leader. And he says, this is bad, or she says, this is bad. And, and therefore I have to follow those orders or those regulations to go into this belief system that is, or this way of treating others other human beings or crew members, fellow crew members on this spaceship Earth and in abhorrent ways. And so I would, you know, not that you have to talk about it in length, but just um, you've obviously figured ways out to deal with it. You're you're doing very well. Things are, are moving forward. And from what I know about you, I, I believe you're also working on that with uh, helping others who are facing those things now, today, and in the past um, to kind of get on, on the right side of history to get into better places who, who have kind of struggled with that. Matter of fact, tomorrow, you're going to be speaking as well um, at an event in, in Berlin, at the Factory Berlin, at giving a keynote and doing a little moderation, uh, uh, Berlin uh, Factory Make IT uh, by with Ukraine is going to be there as well, where there's a lot of uh, diversity and things going on there as well. So I would love to just hear your shortly your thoughts and ideas as we go then deeper into more systems and transformations and and uh, the whys and the purpose and things. Mm -hmm. No, th thank you for that, Mark. Um, so 
so I think maybe there, there are two larger clusters uh, um, that resonate with me, uh, what you just mentioned. One is this whole dichotomy between um, personal responsibility and societal responsibility and how you actually find your way or find your own position, your own voice within a larger context, um, apart from peer pressure and all these dynamics. And the other thing is this very current challenge that we have uh, now, I mean, speaking to you here on the 28th of um, July, 2022, uh, with the Russian war in, in Ukraine. And I'm very, I'm very mindful of my words right now. Um, and of course, uh, I do have a position to that as well. Um, and But I would like to take a step back because I don't see myself as an activist. I just see myself as somebody who's trying to find a clear word, a clear train of thought in this whole fog and this whole confusion and this whole complexity of things. It's navigating through complexity. Um, and uh, so, so there, there are two things. Maybe I'll start with with the last because it's very current, and that's why I feel very proud and very honored to to have this uh, impulse statement or a keynote at the event tomorrow evening around make uh, IT with Ukraine. Uh, for for multiple reasons. Number one, I love startups. I love people taking um, the risk and diving into things and. Uh, having the sense of uh, purpose and personal drive, uh, that and to to start things up. But also right now, you know, living in Europe, we're looking at 77 years after the end of World War II, 77 years of relative peace, but there are a lot of conflicts that we've seen in Europe ever since. So we have never really been a fully peaceful region. I mean, looking at the Yugoslavia wars, looking at, you know, even wars that were not even fought in Europe, but with European participation with, uh, you know, um, Portugal, Morocco. And so, so in these 77 years, we've had a lot of challenges, but at the end of the day, I was still hoping that within Central Europe, we would have like a pilot project, a pilot society that is relatively demilitarized, that is relatively peaceful, that is very inclusive, diverse, that has learned from mitigating up to 28, now 27 uh, European voices. That means we have a lot of experience on debating democracy, debating different interests and finding compromises and listening, listening, finding coalitions and frameworks how we can actually drive drive change and you know drive things forward. And that is something I think that you know Europe, even as an American by you know uh, um, in my heart, uh, I, I say that I really look into or I look up at the European values and the experience that we've had to to mitigate those voices because that actually gives us a much deeper sense and a much more resilient uh, approach to democracy, human rights, um, and a general set of humanistic values uh, that we can uphold through all kinds of transformations, societal transformations, macro trends, technological uh, disruptions, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and that's why I'm saying, you know, navigating through complexity, uh, it's a question about what kind of compass do you have? And that's why it's so important uh, to have these open debates and to constantly challenge what democracy actually stands for. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy in Ukraine, but not since the 24th of February this year, but actually since 2014, um, this war has been going on in Ukraine and Europe has been having quite a challenge to deal with that, right? And to have a very clear position. Uh, and now things have escalated dramatically ever since the end of February. And I see something very tragically happening. And I'd, let me just let me just touch on that for for a second. Um, you know, one thing is, of course, the 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 tragedy of war. And I think, you know, Alexander Kluge, Oskar Nick, they already wrote about these things, you know, Geschichte and Eigensinn about um, or there's this one passage that really stuck with me. Uh, about people being thrown into the situation of live or die, yeah, and to and to and to fight. Um, it's a very physical, a very visceral process and experience. 
Uh, I haven't had any war experience. I don't want to have any war experience. I know my dad had several war experiences and, uh, and he shared that with the family. And that's something that has been with me and has shaped me and has changed me. Um, so uh, that is something I think is so tragic. Um, I don't think anybody, and I'm a proud father of four children, uh, anybody wants to send their children into a war zone. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why sometimes I plead, I want more women in government and in, you know, decision-making positions, because I have the feeling sometimes fathers do not know the value of, you know, bringing, bring children to life, you know, bearing children and bringing them up. And they sometimes go into a war out of pride or dignity or, um, hurt narcissistic feelings um, and at the end of the day it's people actually losing their lives so taking a step back what I see tragically happening from a more systemic perspective and more a long-term perspective because as a futurist I like to look at things what's happening in 10 20 50 500 years from now is War has this extreme flattening effect on society. Uh, militarization goes through all aspects and dimensions of civilian life, um, from education to the most um, mundane jobs you can think of. Uh, things start to militarize. And this whole flattening of society is something that is very counter-innovative, um, uh, counter-future-driven. And, um, and also always creates like a like a, 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 a nourishing ground like a you know a petri dish for uh, nationalistic for um, militarized for uh, totalitarian systems and even if you're on the right side of history it is still going to have an effect on your own society even if you're in the defense position um, that's why I think now with Ukraine even though we're at the at, at the peak of this war situation, now we should already start thinking about the society after the war, right? And think about, you know, how can we reinvest into infrastructure, into education, into civilian life? So people, once this war is hopefully over, people can get back to their normal lives and start, you know, um, living an open and diverse and inclusive society. So long story short, that is one tragic aspect um, um, that I see happening. And that's why I feel very much called to this event um, tomorrow evening to actually talk about startups and technologies and how we can reinvest into a future society after the war. Um, yeah, that's that's one aspect. And that, that touched me very much and I have to process that a bit. Um, what was the, the other aspect? I mean, it's also really, um, you know, German mother, American father. Um, I don't know if you, you're a military baby. I'm kind of a military baby myself. And so, the, I mean, that ties into what we're seeing in, in war and how our world is truly divor uh, diverse and, and broad and big and the realities of things, but also with the struggles that, you know, of of nationalism, Nazism, uh, however you want to say it within your own family, but yet that's where you live. You live in Germany, speak great German, uh, and uh, there's and there's uh, also a sense of pride and uh, and and things in that as well as being a global citizen and having that diversity and ha say, you know we're we're all uh, crew members on spaceship earth. And I, I did, sure. didn't really even, sure. we don't even really need to go in, in that much depth, but I think it just makes the the whole of of who Pascal is and what you deal with and how you help that and in, in the things that you do and the people's lives that you touch is so amazing. And and then the last thing is really the the, the last question that you answered first is, is really where I want to get into it because if we were looking back 20 years of how we were working and, and doing business and, and um, dealing with the word, when you, t when you talked with a startup, or when you talked about IT, when you talked about um, any of those subjects, there was no, there was no, this, this extra discussion about diversity. There was no extra discussion about the climate and the environment and 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 s corporate social responsibility. You didn't have to kind of give people a big history lesson or kind of go out and say, 
because it's the right thing to do, because this is how we create resilient, desirable futures, because this is the the, the correct way and, and uh, more equitable and fair and better resulting models to get us to the, to a desirable future where we're not struggling with war and climate issues and pandemics and things that back then it was just like, just give me the short version, the elevator pitch. I only want you to talk about just that IT one thing. And it was more of a siloed or linear approach. Mm -hmm. And at, and all the discussions we have, I mean, we're already almost into an hour of our discussion now and uh, talking, you know, in, in the end effect of what are the models that we're operating? At? What are some of the things? And we've talked about diversity. We've talked about philosophy. We've talked about so many different aspects that it's just not simple enough to say it's this business as usual, very siloed, very linear, because we're talking about people. We're talking about lives. We're talking about community. We're talking about a bigger sense of things. And whether it's a pandemic that is exponential and affects everybody in the world, or if it's a war, it's a war between two countries that is in one part of the world in, in Ukraine, it affects all of us. It's not a discussion of just siloed one thing, there's black and white. Uh, it's much more complex than that. And I think that's what I pull out of, of what you're saying and, and your diversity and your background. And and I, I just wanna know, how did we get there? I mean, is that normal? Is that, do we need to have those discussions? How do you feel about that? That we're kind of, you know, I, I know very well that that back uh, uh, when we were working, when we were speaking, when we were doing things, it was just kind of the elevator pitch, the short version, the quick TED talk. We're talking about <laughs> one aspect and all this other things really didn't matter. But those were also times where we weren't solving any global problems, that where we weren't getting ahead because we were taking that siloed linear approach at, at, at the world. Mark, and that's exactly why I think it's so wonderful to to talk to you about that because, um, and I learn every time I have that exchange with you, is this whole systems thinking. And I know that you're a big fan of of systems thinking, and you're professional in that. And that's exactly what we need. That's exactly the competency that we need today. Uh, there, there was a there was a meme going around several years ago. It was a black and white picture of of um, of somebody at a university library going through you know these these little wooden drawers, you know, pulling them out of the the wall, and it was these book cards, right? These book cards where you take this card and you go up to the front and you ask if the book is there, and then you the get this Dewey whole pile of books. system. Exactly. Yeah, and you go take that pile of books then, and you go to your desk at the library. And the whole air is filled with these uh, fumes from the Xerox machine. And then you try to like, you know, make your marks and you go take, make your photocopies and the, you know, Xerox copies and you sit down and you start working with them. You bring the books back. And the funny thing was, the, or the, I, I can't say it verbatim, but the, 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 the tagline under this meme was whoever knows what this picture is about. I mean, this woman pulling out this, this little, this little drawer with these little book cards, whoever knows what this really is studied or was at the university before Google yeah, was invented. And, and it's true. It's true. I mean, today, things are so interconnected. There's a much higher level of transparency of what's going on. Uh, it's not only about, and we can debate that, I do not believe in $69.95 tickets to to you know across the world and everything it's not sustainable but we as a society are globalized we have a globalized pandemic we have a globalized economy we have globalized culture still have pockets of course yeah nationalistic pockets cultural pockets and so forth but we know of each other yeah the data is there yeah things are obvious and um but also there's something that we personally, we feel much more interconnected with all the things around us. Yeah. Um, when I wake up in the morning and I take a shower, it's like, um, how much water do I use? Yeah. All, all the way down to how is it heated? And now with the surging gas prices due to the war situation, all of a sudden things are interconnected when I eat. Yeah. Am I vegetarian? Am I vegan? Or do I eat meat? What is my impact? Yeah, we have to be careful though, because you know that there's this industrial 
communication spin to talk about your personal carbon footprint and uh, forgetting the industrial aspect to it because that's the much larger part. And we have to be very, very, very honest about things. I'm not talking about the activist voice, yeah? And don't get me wrong. I mean, I love what Greta has been doing. I love Fridays for Future and I love the, um, all the activists out there because those are very important voices that will constantly keep us um, on our toes on you know what are we forgetting out there. But yeah, if I take a look at um, how everything is interconnected, the wars that we're having yeah, the geopolitical standoffs, um, it's all about resources. It's all about energy. Yeah, it's all about fighting for having this top one position in the whole energy value chain. You know, we're talking about oil. We're talking about access to information. We're talking about access to data. We're talking about, you know, you know, we can get into the whole thing around the South Chinese Sea and with Taiwan and chip production and information technology. We can talk about the whole oil and energy value chain that's out there into that goes from uh, crude oil all the way down to plastics. It's, you know, we have to be very clear about that the modern day war is very much a battle for um, resources. And, and that's where I really hope and pray, and I don't use these words very lightly, uh, don't get me wrong, but I really hope and pray that we will be able to take that next step to really understand that we're all in this together. As you say, we're all, you know, we're all a member or we're all a um, crew member, of spaceship a crew member Earth. exactly, on spaceship Earth. And there's only one humankind, right? And there's only one one habitat yeah that can provide us with those resources and we really need to understand how we're going to be able to feed and provide energy in a sustainable way for almost 10 billion people by the year 2050 and we're on that trajectory yeah of course there are numbers that say okay after 2050 we're going to see a dip in in population uh etc uh but this is not a wild card that is not like you know your carte blanche that we can just keep on going i mean we're on july 28th earth overshoot day um this is so we're almost you know almost at the half of the year where we're actually you know depleting earth's resources that can be regenerated within a year um this is a, a no-go situation yeah um yeah so everything is interconnected and we cannot, and that actually goes back to the first question I didn't answer uh, before about, you know, individualism versus, you know, being part of a larger society, a larger group, a larger system is um, we cannot say anymore. We didn't know about it. Yeah, I cannot. I mean, Internet data information is so ubiquitous. I cannot say today, oh, I did not know that my meat consumption or my fish consumption or my you know industrial processed food consumption had such an impact on the environment yeah that information is out there and it's readily available is what we do with that yeah i'm not trying to moralize yeah let's take the whole moral discussion out of it and just try, try to be as factual as possible is it sustainable that we all have such a high meat consumption is it sustainable that we have such a high fossil fuel consumption? Yeah. And those are two questions where I can just clearly say, no, it's not responsible. Yeah. It's it, the equation. The math does not fit up. Yeah. Does, I'm just trying to get a breather right now. Because... Yeah, you're fine. No, that that's perfectly fine. I want, I think you're, you're, you're right in the right direction. Now I want to really make a, a, a shift on, on, and I want to go into three areas on really on the why or purpose. And then I want to go into resilience and into transformation. And I want to start out with um, uh, a big, huge uh, fan and, and mentor of mine is our Buck Minister Fuller lived from uh, 1895 to 1983. And in um, 1969, he um, 
uh, published a book, uh, and but he he said this even before that at uh, one of his world games, and, and it basically is his why or his purpose. And what I thought was so cool about it, it it's um, f it's it's a why that envelops the whole world. It envelops um, all, all crew members of Spaceship Earth. There are no passengers, and he he said his why and purpose was to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without the ecological offense or disadvantage of anyone. And 1968, wow, unbelievable. And, and it was in his book, in the inside cover of his book, um, the operating manual for Spaceship Earth. Well, one, as a parent, uh, you as a parent, it's like frustrating. These kids didn't come with an operating manual. How, how, do, how do we get this on, on the thing? Well, our, our Earth didn't come with an operating manual either. And we're still today, we're figuring this all out. But in your opening, uh, qu the opening question uh, that I gave you and in your answer, you really talked about purpose and your why. And I want to hear one first, your your why. I want to know your why and your purpose for existing. And then I want to dive in a little bit deeper why it's important. How do you find it? How do you get it? Is everybody's <laughs> different? Things like that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's one of the most beautiful questions you can ask, Mark. And and thank you for that. 1969, I was one year old. 1969, Apollo 11 mission, uh, the first human on the moon. Um, the 70s, I grew up with these kind of pictures. I grew up with that kind of sense of space exploration. We were still debating if there were a black hole at the centers of galaxy. And we think there's one at ours, but we don't know about the others. And and look where we've where we've come to now with the James Webb Space Telescope out there. LIGO has been you know operative already since several years, uh, pro proving gravitational waves and proving that Einstein you know, was right. Um, yes, so there's something very 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 personal in this whole thing, and I'm not saying, or I'm not proclaiming that you need to have um personal life challenges to to get to a certain point or to a certain level of insight i can only share what what drove me and what my experiences were and uh, and i think everybody has their own path to to get to a certain point um so one story I mean, I already shared the part of the spectrum that I grew up in, the cultural spectrum, which was, you know, very, very diverse, yeah, and uh, very contradictory as well. So this whole thing about um, dealing with contradictions um, and reflecting in that space is something that is that comes natural to me. Uh, another another life experience was uh was 16 so with 16 my family more or less dissolved it was a very dramatic uh divorce story in uh with my parents uh with the result that my father went you know went abroad and my mother moved away with my with my siblings and with 16 i was homeless so i was homeless in a german city yeah in frankfurt and uh, so, you know, living on the street, you know, begging for money, trying to get food uh, um, together, um, living in these, what you call these little uh, Schriebergärten, yeah? So I would find some kind of hut in some kind of garden um, space. I don't even know the English term for these Schriebergärten. It's a very German thing. Um, and then, you know, trying to find a space where I can sleep overnight or trying to like, you know, and had some school friends, um, that were helping me out, but uh, ultimately I had to leave the school system. And it took me a while to get back into that school system. So I had a very dramatic experience on a personal level. What does it mean to be homeless? What does it mean to lose everything or 
the only thing I had on me was a small bag and, you know, two pairs of shorts and three pairs of socks and an extra pair of pants and a few t-shirts and a toothbrush and, uh, and just a few D marks at the time, you know, uh, worth a few euros. And that is something, you know, and then trying to recover from that. And that took like several months to several years to actually, I wouldn't say get back on my feet because I never lost footing. Yeah. It was something about personal resilience and it was something about how do I survive today? Yeah. How can I get into the next day? Am I going to be freezing tonight? Yeah. What am I going to eat tomorrow? And that's this thing about personal resilience. And all of a sudden, you know, if I look back at it, I was thrown back on myself to say, what am I about? Or what am I made of? Or what do I want to do? And for me, what came up very early on was I cannot leave school. I don't know why, but there was something, a voice in me that said, school, education, that is my safe space. Yeah, that's where I have to get back into. And that is going to carry me into the future. Because, you know, going then to some kind of supermarket, at Aldi at the time, I mean, that came a few, you know, years later, you know, working with jobs and working here and there just for a few pennies uh, to maintain a school life. Yeah, because I did get back into school and, uh, and I found a place where I could then live that was uh, a state funded space for homeless children and uh, there I could finish my, my my school and then move on then into university so I was able to really you know get back into the system and fully fully leverage it um, that's where I can only share my own impulse is to say what is personal resilience and what is a focus point and for me a focus point was I need to learn, I need to develop, I need to grow. And the only place I can do that is in the space where I'm being, where I find the nourishment, yeah, the, the mental, the cognitive nourishment to, to grow and to learn. And that's the only safe space for, for children. And to be honest with you, <clears throat> also for us grownups as well. Yeah. And that's why I'm a big, big advocate of lifelong learning because that's the only space or we can really sit down and I'm just looking at my own library and I just love, you know, picking out from whatever. I just stumbled over Howard Rheingold and virtual reality from the early 90s, uh, just reading up to my, some of my very old books um, and what, what the people at the time were thinking of, how the future would look like. Um, but that is something that I can only tell people, even when you're in your career and you've already gone through a lot of steps in your career, always get back into this experience of being the small child again, sit at your desk or go out and talk to people and just learn, learn, debate, discuss, open your mind, challenge yourself, challenge your own beliefs. Um, that is, that is something that I'm very, very adamant about. And, and so in, in surmising your why is, I don't even want to take take the words out of your mouth it's it's about learning having that child there but is do you have that in a sentence do you have that in a paragraph or or a purpose how you would uh if somebody said hey what's your why how would you answer that question so so the, the personal why goes goes very much into this whole thing about my own legacy so if if i look back and of course it's a luxury um, being already as old as I am, uh, and it's hard to have that level of thinking with 20 or 25 or 30 looking back at my own life. Um, uh, but if I had the chance to visit myself, uh, go, go back, you know, to, to 30 years or 20 years ago, uh, what would I tell myself? Uh, right now, for me, it's I can look back at more time behind me than ahead of me. And, and I can look at my own children and I can only sense what kind of future that they're going to have. They're gonna have a different future than, 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 I, than I had or a different life than, than, than I had. Um, and so 
when I take a look at thing and I and I try to create this balance sheet, yeah, this whole accounting balance sheet about my life, how have I paid into my life's experience? How have I paid into my planetary footprint, my cultural footprint, my community footprint? Um, how have I dealt with friendships? How have I dealt with relationships? Um, that is the why that that drives me, that drives me today, yeah? And has actually always driven me, but I've never really been that aware of it that until now where all of a sudden you can feel the age and you can feel the time that has passed and you can sense that, or I can sense that, um, life is a very, very short kind of time. It's a ticket. It's a ticket, you know, to travel on this spaceship Earth for a very limited time. Way too short, by the way, compared to the cognitive abilities that we have and what we can actually still learn in several lifetimes. But, you know, I have the feeling that, you know, I haven't really even started yet. Yeah, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm not there yet. So I have the feeling that yeah. the, day, the day I die, I'm going to go like, yeah, now I'm ready. <laughs> now I'm ready. But actually, actually, if it comes down to it, Mark, it would be then to say, now I'm ready to go. Yeah. That's beautiful. And yeah. Yeah. I, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I love everything you talked about and, and uh, love your why and your purpose. Also the, the big history of it, how you, you, um, how it's defined you, how you use that to, to do a lot of reflection, but it's also shaped you moving forward. Um, the only thing I would um, stray away from is nobody's taking a ticket. We're not passengers. There's nobody here that's been dropped off by some other spaceship, or, uh, Germany, USA, or other planet we we crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth from from our mothers of course but uh we crawled out of this earth the basic elements of us and so therefore there is no passenger there is no there is no um non-observers uh, even even children babies infants and elderly who um have issues disabled people they're all crew members in some form or another to um add to the symbiosis of, of our world so to to yes to teach or to guide or to to help uh others in certain respects or to be that infant crew member to show us how how do families work how does the symbiosis of that family structure work on an, on an infant or a newborn who uh, is helpless and and can't do much what what are they teaching us on how how much of a symbiote relationship we just have in our family construction and how how vital that is when you're left on your own at age 16 to figure it out on your on your own and and to figure out how the world works um how that symbiosis can really help you to reconnect to heal to to build that future that you want and so um, I, I, I think there's too many people who, who think that their passengers are along for the good old ride to ride it out or to, uh, continue on with an extractive world. And so I love that answer, but the hardest question I'm going to ask you today is, is the one I'm going to ask you now. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's, um, can be defined as, as, uh, uh the burning question, but I, I'm going to phrase it a little bit different and I want your version um as succinct as possible what does a world that works for everyone look like to you pascal oh wow 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 um so i'm not prepared for that question um as i'm just loving the flow of this conversation but that question already ignites a whole rainbow flash in my head um, and actually that's already part of the question, uh, part of the answer. Um, so there you uh, go. I tell you one thing, I think, uh, um, for me, the perfect world is just not perfect. There's nothing perfect. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a mess of colors of, 
sounds, of cultures, of interests, of people, of ages, generations. Um, it is uh, very much a sharing economy, a sharing society, an interconnected society, and a solution-driven society. Not so much around efficiency. It's, um, I think, you know, that's that's one of the misperceptions that we have is that we have to become more and more efficient from an economic perspective. Uh, yes, now we have to become more and more efficient on how we actually utilize energy and resources, but that's not the efficiency question. It's because we have this challenge that we're exploiting the, our habitat uh, beyond, beyond repair. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's it's a very it's a very diverse it's a very inclusive world and it's a world where we actually cherish the most valuable thing that we have is our next generations is our children um, and of course leverage the most beautiful thing that we also have is the knowledge and wisdom of our um, older generations and bringing those things together um, and I think we have don't I don't want to do this kumbaya. Uh, thing, but you asked me a question, and I am an idealist, yeah, um, um, and I love dystopian science fiction uh, stories and novels. But at at my heart, in my heart, really, um, I do have a very idealistic uh, um, outlook on how we can actually turn things around. You know, sometimes even as an American. And maybe you can relate to that. And just a, a funny side story. Um, so uh, this thing, this cultural difference between Germans and Americans, you go to a movie theater and uh, you watch the movies and there's this very emotional moment where people prove themselves or they hold this long big speech or whatever or let's all come together and the whole audience they're on their toes and all yelling yay i mean something you would never do in europe everybody's very quiet in the movie theaters in europe and uh, they just watch these things and sometimes things get a little bit too cheesy but the americans are all out for the whole you know this whole uh, emotional expression. The funny thing is we always want to have these stories, you know, where things work out, where we get together. We are, we always tell each other these fairy tales, you know, this good versus bad. And at the end of the day, the good prevails and we find a way how we can get together, how we can fight off this meteor impact, how we can fight off these aliens, how we can, you know, fight off the bad guys and so forth. And the funny thing is, then we walk out the door and we just dump our plastic waste somewhere. We walk past uh, a Jewish synagogue, and we 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 think we're we're better. We look down at somebody of color. We um, think this society has an advantage over another society. Uh, we don't want our kids to play with certain other kids. We don't, you know, and and all of a sudden, you know, things all of a sudden fall apart. So this whole narrative of us being like one community, one world, yeah, all of a sudden falls apart on a very personal level, yeah. And that's why I, th I would like to start asking those questions and saying, what is going wrong? I mean, why can't we find a way how we can um, foster a system, uh, of, uh, interconnected society that is built on shared values, as colorful as they are, all walks of life, yeah. Um, and sometimes I'm sad. I'm looking at, for instance, at the U.S., you know, at the Supreme Court decisions. I mean, first they overturned uh, the New York, you know, um, uh, gun rules, um, uh, strengthening the Second Amendment. Um, and then we have these shootings, you know. Um, then they overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, and we're probably going to see something happening, you know, versus um, gay marriages. Uh, so so there are certain tendencies of the pendulum swinging back into time, back into history, um, and not forward into a more inclusive society. <clears throat> um, that's why I'm saying I am idealistic, but I would call myself a more of a pragmatic philosopher. So it's about pragmatism. Um, it's about, of course, we do need certain rules and governance and certain frameworks. But at the end of the day, I mean, if we talk about war, or if we talk about abortion, um, of course, there are things where you can say, well, 
who thinks abortion is a good thing? It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing for anybody who's involved, yeah, and especially well, not I, for the women. But the thing I, is, but the thing yeah. is, in the pragmatics of it, what <clears throat> do you tell um, uh, somebody who's been uh, a victim of a sexual assault? Who do you tell somebody who's fourteen and is pregnant? Uh, what do you tell these women? Can you really take the the right away of deciding over your own body? Is that something that is future pure for society? No, it is again exclusive. It is um, patronizing. It is um, creating a very rigid framework that is not inclusive. So, so that's why I say I am idealistic in a certain way, but it's about pragmatism. I mean, if we put people and purpose and um, humanistic values into the center of things, that in itself is going to give you the, let's say the, the, the color board with which you can actually paint this very colorful future society. I hope that makes sense. It, it does, but I, it also opens up a whole nother can of words. So I really yes. don't want to get, I, I don't really <laughs> want to get into um too too much of the specifics, but I I, I do uh, I do want to make some comments and kind of just some some suggestions. So uh, we didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones, and thank goodness. I mean, uh, I think we still we we still need some stones. Um, so and I think we can still use stones for for a lot of lot of th things, and <clears throat> it's important for that respect. But when we talk about uh, and and uh, the United States Constitution, or if we talk about any other politics around the world, what what is there? Um, a bunch of white men um, before they had cars, before they had uh, um, a lot of the innovations and technologies, um, setting up a piece of paper. A document that we're holding on to that is outdated, antiquated, racist. It's uh, pretty much any anything you could throw at it. Um, I'll tell you what: when the Constitution was done, maybe that was their definition of the question that I asked you: What does a world that works for everyone look like for those? founding fathers who wrote the constitution that's probably what it looked like but it's not what it looks like today and it's not, definitely not anything i want to be part of uh i don't want to be part of rule versus way gun law whatever um let's get out of uh the this world of of uh short-termism and uh, racism yeah. and all sure. sorts of other things and let's sure. get into something a world that works for everyone and so that that leads to really kind of a follow-up question and i don't i don't want to put you on the spot i don't want to you don't need to have the answers for everybody and 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 that's not what it's all about your answer is a beautiful one and it's very individualistic and i think it's it's one that's it works fabulous for you and your family but the next question is, um, is, is that working for you or what models are you currently living? Are you living that model? Is that your model that you live day in and day out? Or are you also living a little bit of capitalism? Are you living an extractive economy? Are you, are you voting for the Green Party for Germany? What are the models that you're stuck into in your work, your private life, you're that are you are you kind of maybe running three different models of what that the maybe the founding fathers of Germany or maybe the last miracle or the Green Party or SDP or F CDU or or whatever party it is have set up some models or maybe it's even the EU has some you know the the Green Deal the new Green Deal or or whatever type of models are you living any of those currently that you can say yeah. I'm, there's four of them that I'm kind of living by default or, or whatever. I, I would like to know the realities beyond that. Why, what, what models you're living? Uh, great, Mark. So to be very specific on that, three steps. You talked about the Stone Age. Um, yes, we're looking at 
let's say, you know, some anthropologists say we're looking back at 3 million years of Stone Age history, 1 million years since the invention of fire, and 300,000 years since the evolution of the hominids. And within that branches out the Homo sapiens, and we're like, okay, we have a cranium large enough that will hold something that can, you know, be self-aware yeah, and understand their footprint in their own environment. Yeah. And, uh, but as you said, we did not leave the stone age because we ran out of stones. And it's the thing of, can thinking of the past be the right framework for the future? And you talked about the founding fathers and you're absolutely right. We don't have to go into the Roe versus Wade and so forth, but 1776 at the time when that was actually put into paper, at the time that was innovative. Yeah, they wanted to, um, you know, um, emancipate from the British colonies to, to a new self identity and have a more Republican approach that said, now today that sounds antiquated, right? So what do we learn from history? What we learn from history is we cannot like design frameworks like 1776 founding fathers, the framework of independence and say that that is going to carry us into the future. We need a different way of thinking. We need a different way of thinking of systems that the future can define itself, that the peoples of the future can define themselves, that they can find their own. And when I say it's a, because you mentioned, you said that it sounded very individualistic. It was not meant as an individualistic society where you know you preach hedonism and everybody is unfolding on a very personal level. Um, and yes, there is a component to that. I mean, there are so many walks of life. Um, I don't want to have any more of this pivoting, right? There's nothing see. there's nothing negative yeah. about that yeah. at all. That what I meant yeah. by individualistic is, and that's exactly what I want. I wanted your personal why. I didn't want to hear what exactly. your family's, your your father, your mother's or I wanted to hear your personal why, and that is individualistic, and that's exactly what we need, um, and that's the answer. What I wanted: what, what, what does a world that works for everyone look for, like for you, for Pascal? So and, I give you a very and, good example. And, yeah. and you get, and you gave me that answer, and 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 um, and I think it's fine. There's nothing wrong with the individualistic. But then the follow-up question, which what I, what I uh, after I made the st statement about the Stone Age, is how do we really um, is is that the is that the model that um, works for everybody, or are we actually all living some different kind of models? Yeah. And I I just wanted to know personally what what uh, one or two or of the of the actual models that you're living are. And then I wanted to set up an experiment. I wanted to ask you, I want to say, okay, well, let's take those models that we're currently in and let's push them out into the future, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Yes. Are they still working for us anymore? And I think they're going to have to change. I mean, just to get back to my to my personal uh, term, and I wanted to build this bridge because, you know, some people might understand individual, individualism of maximizing your own personal profit, which I think has always been the culprit of an exploitational value chain. But more, if you go into individualism with an, a 360 degree awareness of how we actually interface our community and our environment and our resources, and what are we willing to transact you know, to balance things out. So me personally, I know I'm very aware of being a member of a transitional generation, yeah? Um, so I do not live in a commune. I do not live um, um, in, on a farm, yeah, where I'm just growing my own resources. I am in a city and I'm using technology that has been built in Asia, yeah. Um, we do drive electric, yeah. We have um, electric mobility here in our household. Um, I, I live um, in, in a balanced relationship where my wife and I, we have um, shared responsibility over our children, over our household, but also over our jobs and our careers. Yeah. So I, I know that I've already taken a very, very, very large step from my previous generation and also from my parents uh, because they actually 
they actually um, they could not make that model work, and that's why there was this uh, huge, huge divide. But in the very beginnings, it was a very clear, you know, I remember as a kid getting getting mail out of the mailbox. It was addressed to Mrs. John A. Morgan, and that was actually addressed to my mom. So, you know, I come from a complete different background. I've taken a huge step forward. So, yes, I, I have a vegetarian uh, lifestyle. And, yes, I look at how, what kind of things I use. I want to buy uh, organic. I, um, I want to live in a more energy-balanced uh, environment, yeah? Um, don't use fossil fuels to to heat my to heat my living space and my office. Yeah, um, I offset my own office work with uh, you know I offset my carbon footprint. Offsetting is only transitional solution. It is not the end solution. But you know that's why I I know I'm very fully aware I'm in this transitional generation. In 30 years from now, things have to have a much more trans you know fundamental shift and and transition. And I respect a lot of people that are doing that now, that are building, for instance, uh, communes outside of cities and are building you know sustainable. Um, circular local economies. And I think those are the things that we can actually learn from and we need to foster more moving forward into the future. I love it. Thanks. Thanks for answering that. And thanks for clarifying it. I really um, strongly believe that when you have that type of approach, what happens is you become more at dis-ease with those systems around you from governments, from constitutions, from uh, the things that the Supreme Court's doing, the things that the German governments are doing, the wars from Ukraine, the things that we see around the world. Um, uh, in, a, in a big respect for uh, what's going on in Ukraine, if we were to take uh, fossil fuels out of the equation, if we were to take food as a commodity out of the equation, there wouldn't be much to fight about you know, because we've just taken the resources out of, out of the equation. There wouldn't be much to fight about. There's an added layer to that as we've also made fossil fuels and food into commodities sure. that are traded like investments and stocks and, and uh, pushed around the world for profit not really to heal and feed and, and to take care of people, but at uh, as a commodity. When you turn something into a commodity, you cheapen that product or that, that commodity, which in turn cheapens life, whether it's um, <clears throat> fossil fuels, whether it's food, whether it's cars or products, uh, cell phones, someone, and usually always included in that someone uh, pays the price as also yeah. the environment pays a huge cost to that price. Um, and uh, so I have friends and, and, and who are doing numerous things and you all, we're, you're, we're also part of that through Future IO and other organizations are doing major things to, to help the Ukraine, to help change some of those models and to... Um, ease the 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 plight and and the problems and the struggles of those who who have left the Ukraine and gone somewhere else to learn a new language to to get footing in a, at a place that's no longer their home because of what's going on hopefully they can return one day but if not uh, we want to integrate them and get them on their feet and get back to living um, a good life. But now they're accepting some of the models within Europe and around the world that uh, are other policies and crazy things that are going on. Um, so I, 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 you know, I don't want to get on the soapbox, but I'm glad you answered that. I think you did it perfectly. And I, I was a little bit tough on you because I told you it was going to be my toughest question for you. The last one really goes into the, uh, almost both aspects that I wanted to talk to you about, and that is really um, resilience and transformation. So it's not only part of the title of your uh, of your company, but it's important to you. When I speak about resilience, for me, there's really three main definitions that are used by the United Nations and 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 the most well accepted. I belong to Resilience Frontiers, which will probably uh, be the next iteration after the Sustainable Development Goals, the Resilience Development Goals. 
Um, and we've already created and started working on that resilience frontiers pathway. So um, the eight pathways and pillars mm -hmm. towards uh, transforming our world and society. And those three definitions of resilience, the first one is kind of the one that you speak a lot about and that we've heard in your stories is a resilience of emotional, mental, um, physical resilience. If somebody swears at you or hits you, spits at you or mentally or physically abuses you, that you have the resilience to recover from that. Or maybe you don't, maybe you become disabilitated or take your own life or something happens that's tragic <clears throat> where you don't have that resilience. So there's kind of that emotional, mental and physical type of resilience. How do you bounce back from your own individual traumas and things that things that occur to you? The second one is a dystopian resilience. It's one where tomorrow or the next hour we still can survive and be alive on our earth but it's pretty dystopian we're wearing gas masks spacesuits oxygen masks we've it's gray outside or there's acid rain or we don't have any water or we're fighting over resources we've all of a sudden become into a, a state where we're fighting against each other or fighting over these resources and it's kind of a you know uh mad max water world it's a uh, it's a it's what we're seeing in the movies. It's a very dystopian type of a, of a scenario. And then the last one is resilient, desirable futures. And it's resilience where the next day, the next hour after we've had a major hurricane or a supercell storm that uh, drops these rain bombs of, of water in, in one tiny area that just cannot be physically absorbed by our world that the very next hour we have infrastructure, energy, food, shelter, uh, and we can go on and we can still enjoy clean air, nature, and, and that because we've begun this rest, restorative process and, that, and that's a resilience. And a lot of people confuse <clears throat> the fact that if you're really sustainable, um, you have that resilience and you do not. Uh, you have, sometimes they'll have a glimmer or some little aspects of, of resilience within sustainability. But what that sustainable bill core or sustainability gives you is a solid infrastructure to springboard off into, into resilience. It gives you the ability that when those natural things or even man-made um, anthropogenic uh, issues come into our world where we have creating uh, climate problems that are affecting us with heat waves, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that we have systems in place that are restoring or resiliently through innovations, clean technologies to provide us with that infrastructure to be able to, to deliver the basic resources or infrastructure that we need the very next hour. And that uh, that last one is a resilient, desirable futures infrastructure, and that that's kind of the the definition there. Mm -hmm. I want to know what your definition is. I want to know if you agree, what you think as well, and why have you taken up the the banner um, about resilience? Obviously, I, I can hear it out and and, and see and in the journeys and your stories you've described to me that there's been a lot of aspects in there in multiple levels, but I'd like to hear a little bit from you about that. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's very, very important to, to have a better understanding of what resilience is or can be what it's not. Yeah. Uh, Listening to what you're saying, and I, and I fully agree with your with with the system. What I hear, what resonates with me, I hear a lot of this whole thing about what are our beliefs actually, yeah, and especially with you know number two with this dystopian thing, um, I do see a tendency. I mean, the how we humans function, you know, bad news travels ten times as fast and as powerful than good news. 
Um, there's also a psychological pattern behind that is that we learn from other people's plights or challenges or disasters. Uh, there is a community forming function of that, of reading bad news and catastrophes and um, it has formed societies. Um, we have um, called to arms to defend and all of a sudden out of this defense comes a new national identity. There is something very, uh, don't get me wrong, but there's something very negative in the way how we think and our function and the way how our emotional, um, let's say, uh, subsystem actually works and how we focus, like to focus on bad news. And it's it's really tough challenge to say, okay, how can we change our belief system, our core belief system, and have a more positive outlook and have a better understanding on what are our desirable futures and have that this this inner sense of a desirable future as deeply ingrained in us, yeah, as right now the way how we react to bad news, yeah. And, and not always have this, you know, every generation thinks they're, you know, when you get older, the older you get, the more negative you become and say, this is the end of the world. I mean, there's this constant thing about the elderly generations, actually, it's their own fear of passing and maybe, you know, um, being pushed out into the fringe of society and not being in the core of society of being able to share their wisdom with the younger generation. Um, so, Yes, I think the whole thing around resilience is going to be a challenge on how can we start developing positive pictures and positive belief systems that can actually drive us forward. Uh, exactly the questions that you've been asking me. I mean, what do we teach our children in schools? Um, do we have these conversations about, you know, how do you envision the future for yourself? And let's start painting a picture. Let's start doing a project. Let's start working on solutions on what we can do. You know, you're six, you're seven, you're eight, you're nine, you're 10, you're 11, 12 years old. Yeah. Let's start working on that. And then you grow up. It's, it's a natural part of your way of thinking as a grown up, as an adult, because you have been exposed to that from the very beginning is to say, what is your picture, your imagination, your projection on, on the, uh, you know, the future. Uh, I mean, I give you an example, this whole thing. I was at the climate conference. I was in New York in 2019 when, when Greta was there. And, and I, I will recall being, being greeted by, by uh, a delegation. Um, I don't want to go too deep into, into names and details, but uh, it was a general. It was a delegation of of elderly business representatives and political representatives, and uh, we were in New York. And I don't know if you recall at the time, it was actually very hot in New York in September. It was actually unusually warm for a September day. And Greta was was going to meet um, Angela Merkel, um, the chant, the German Chancellor at the time, and I was, you know. I was shaking hands with this delegation delegation and there's this very senior person coming up to me and I was like saying, you know, it's good that we're here because we can see with the weather now it's time for us to act and it's great that Greta is here. And the response was, yeah, sure, it's very warm, but I'm not going to have, what's it? I'm not going to have things dictated by a 16 year old at the time. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and I was like taken aback and I was going like, hold on for a second, um, what is his perspective on what the young generation represents and why they are so important and why their voices are so important? Is Greta the CEO of a $50 billion company? No, and that's not her role, Yeah, but it's about her future and it's about our habitat and that pertains us all. And that's this kind of thinking that we have to really change is to say, you know, you know, I, I just, I still grew up in this whole legacy framework. Yeah. And for me, it's a challenge every day to have this positive outlook. And uh, it's a challenge every day when you have all these things like, you know, you're being bombarded by, by, by negative news and by, you know, this is, it's very, and it is very dramatic. Yeah. Um, and you also touched this whole thing about, you know, dramatic uh, experiences and, and traumata and mental health and uh, mental illness and resilience is, is core at that. But 
I don't want to make it too simple because I hear the, I, I hear too many slogans. You see that on LinkedIn and business platforms and everything about be yourself and be resilient and be positive. And these are the 10 things you need to do. And Buddha said, these are the three things you need to do and everything, which are, by the way, all fake Buddha quotes because Buddha was much more complex than these three things you have to do every day. Um, but long story short, um, we're making it too easy now, throwing it to the next generation to say, just be yourself and you're going to find out and you're going to be resilient and you're going to work this through. No, it's much more complex than that. And we're all we're all part of this. And we're all responsible on really rethinking, on challenging our belief system, start designing desirable future patterns and visions and discussing that with the generations and, and then see how we can start modeling that out with the solutions that we have out there. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's a systemic challenge and it's not something that is just done with one answer. It's a continuous dialogue. Yeah. I don't have the answers. I can only say what my own experience is and I'm being challenged every day, even by my own children. Yeah. They look at me and go like, Hmm, I'm not so sure dad. So, um, and that keeps me on my toes and that keeps me vigilant and that keeps me awake. Yeah. And that's what I would like to share and bring out to the world. Love it. The last question I have, or last thing I want to talk to you about, is really um, your viewpoints on transformation. So I'll give I'll give you mine. Um, in even in our circles, even in the UN, um, we tend to use the word project or change or pilot when we really want to say trans transition or transformation. The problem is with a lot of that is a project, a change, a pilot, they all have a beginning and an end. <laughs> and uh, I'll give you a couple examples. I could decide, okay, I want to grow my beard really long. I want to go on a diet. I want to lose a little bit of weight, get, get, a, get a nice 12 pack, a six pack and really work on myself. I can start out with that. I can have a vision of that change or that project or that that what I think will be a transformation. But then if it gets too hard or if uh, Trump gets elected or if uh, I pass a beautiful smelling bakery with some, some super cheesecakes or some super breads that I want to eat or um, – I, I see something where I say, boy, this beard is just too gray. It's too big. I look like Gandalf. Um, I can shave that beard off or I can go to that bakery and grab, you know, a whole cake of cheesecake and eat it myself or, or something and break that change or that project or whatever it is. Or I can get into a project and say, I, I've run out of money to to do that so i have to stop the project or all of a sudden someone has been elected or something's changed in the organizational structure that's derailed that project or that uh, change a transformation for me is a caterpillar going into a chrysalis and coming out as a butterfly there is no way in hell that butterfly is going to go back into a chrysalis and if it does come out as anything else except but possibly dead. Um, and that is transformation. That is a transition. Mm -hmm. Once you've opened that door, once you've gone through the chrysalis, there is no going back. And that's really what we need. In order to achieve the sustainable development goals, we need to reach six major transformations. And one that most everybody knows about is the digital transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't they don't know that there's getting off of fossil fuels, that there's quality education. Education needs to be revamped and, and mm -hmm. updated. But there are six major transformations. And it really has nothing to do in that respect to the SDGs because those six major transformations were there before the SDGs. They were there with the Millennium Development Goals and they were even there before the Millennium Development Goals. They are six major transformations to get humanity out of the Anthropocene into a new epoch of something else, something that is uh, more equal, more uh, um, better for all humanity on a, on a, on a mm -hmm. truly global level. And I always say I, want, I, I would love us to leave the Anthropocene to get into the Symbiocene. 
I've heard sustaino scene. Mm -hmm. I've heard, you know, the future scene. I've, you know, there's so many things. The, uh, uh, sadly to say, all beautiful. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, had his hundred and third birthday. James Lovelock passed away, mm -hmm. um, and he he his last book that he wrote was the Nova scene. So I mean, that you know, some people think it we we could go into the Nova scene. I would like us to go into the symbiocene, but I mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say that that for me is transformation and it's something that we need to do regardless of what your belief is of the SDGs or the resilience development goals, mm -hmm. resilience frontiers. There, there are things that humanity has been doing and talking about for a long time. What are we going to start doing? What's your, what your view on transformation and, uh, and, and true, true systemic change? Yeah. Um, I think that resonates absolutely with me. Um, and um, so this whole thing around transformation, it's like, transforming to a constant transformation yeah and that's i think what that's how i for instance understand these different scenes and symbiocenes is to really understand ourselves as being part of a symbiotic system we cannot divide ourselves from nature from our habitat from the whole ecosystem around us um that we're all interconnected with each other and it's more for me a question about um fostering this kind of empowerment or insights it's like you know the, even the old testament spoke i mean like adam and eve and don't get me wrong there are a lot of things wrong with this kind of picture of you know the way how humankind should have evolved or whatever but it's the thing it's this process of enlightenment yeah once you eat have the first bite of the apple there's no turning back yeah once you've gone out of the cocoon you're the butterfly you can't go back to the larvae once you know what's going on you cannot say well i don't know anything about it there, there is something we have to face those challenges. And again, what you're also um, very well um, highlighting is there's no answer to all that is going to persist over time. There's only this thing about um, becoming able to face those complex challenges and to evolve through that, right? And then the, the question is, what are our guiding principles? Yeah, um, on moving through this kind of complex uh, change. I mean, talking about the SDGs, what do we need to do before 2030 if we want to actually hit a certain mark? I think the 1.5 uh, centigrade trajectory of global warming is already passed. We have to see how we can get under the stay under the two. Um, the scenarios are not so are not so um, positive right now, um, and that worries me absolutely. We have to talk about the inner development goals as like you know the inner reflection of the SDGs. Um, um, so there's so many things we have to work on. You have VUCA. I mean, I know it's a very military term, but I like from the Harvard Business School how they actually reformed or changed that. So the VUCA with the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and transforming that volatility to vision, um, this uncertainty to understanding this complexity to courage and this ambiguity to adaptability right is to really have a better mindset on how we can actually face those future challenges moving moving forward so in that sense we need to invest into our education 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 a smart enlightened enabled society is going to be able to persist, to survive, and to be resilient. That's why, again, did I mention education? Yeah. So I think it's really so important to, to invest into that. And um, and that's it's beyond political beliefs. It's beyond religious beliefs. It's a, beyond spirituality. It's beyond which camp you think you're in. Um, it's beyond your sexual orientation, your gender. It's really about you know being enabled and empowered and having the tools available to actually you know face these future challenges and uh, and that's why I think the future is is very colorful and and very bright but um right now the challenges are very dire um it's it's quite tough yeah the last question I have for you today, Pascal, is really if there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? And even if it's a systemic message and there's a couple parts to that, that would be fine. 
Um, so hold on. So you want me to give your listeners exactly what? Could you rephrase? Uh, a, a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life. Also, probably tied to your message. So why I wanted you to rephrase that is um, you're ask you're actually asking for that um, for that magical crystal. You're actually asking for that powerful big one message and to be honest with you you're actually you're actually calling to my very pathetic american heart uh to say that one that one magical thing but honestly i'm just um i'm messing with you the thing is if 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 i would really really get into my own self and try to leverage that that last that last part of me um, mobilize that and say, what is this one thing I would um, I would I would share? It might come as a surprise, but uh, it's actually just one word. It's presence. Yeah. It's really being here. I think with presence there's a lot of other things that fall in place that just start to make sense yeah it's being present here with yourself and being present with yourself also means to face some of those fears yeah and some of those trauma time but also your expectations to your future yeah being present here means being present with you yeah being present with my family, with my community, um, being present when I go shopping. Yeah, I see what am I buying? Yeah, what am I doing? Yeah, when I use mobility, yeah, what is my footprint? And don't get me wrong, this is a very, very personal thing. Yeah, it's the moment. It's the mo every moment of of your life. I mean, I've I've I listened to it. There was a neuroscientist uh, being interviewed on NPR. I think some twenty something years ago, and and I I don't recall his name and I don't recall the setting, but there was something that I will never forget. And I tried to do some research. I never found out who that actually was. Uh, but he was talking about you know the three most important things in his life, and that really stuck with me and it was number one it was physical health number two was mental health number three was spiritual or soul or health of spirit and then everything else like spouse children family community jobs and everything everything else came after that so a very untypical answer i was going like that was almost blasphemic. How can you do that? How can you put your family after that? And he was saying, saying well, if I'm mentally, you know, if I'm physically not healthy, then everything else doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to be sick the whole time. The same thing with my mental health. If, my, if I don't have my full cognitive abilities, yeah, I won't be able to you know, leverage my competencies and be of value. The same thing with my own health of spirit. Yeah, my emotional well-being, my spiritual well-being, uh, my sense of purpose. Yeah, and when those three things are somehow in balance, then I can be a good husband, a good father, a good friend, a good colleague. Yeah, then I can really be of value to others, and others will welcome me as part of their lives. Yeah. And that really resonated with me. And that's, and for me, the key to that is presence. I love it. Yeah, I, I would uh, I agree with you as well. I, I um, believe that when you're not numb or desensitized, when you have that presence of moment of time with people, uh, with planet, with nature, um, mm. there's also uh, so many other things that just ripple effect off of that, of how you um, feel, see the the world around you and those around you, and uh, it's it's beautiful. 
I really thank you, Pascal, for letting us inside of your ideas, for getting very personal, going back into your big history and, and, and giving us a deep dive in there and then how you, you think about the future. Um, I know we can expect much more from you. I'll put the links to your web pages and, and things, but that's pretty much all I have for you today. Unless there's something that you did not get to talk about, you can have uh, this last couple minutes to 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 let us know. But otherwise, I really thank you for letting us inside of your ideas. Well, Mark, I can only say thank you back. Um, this was a pleasure and it was an honor. And thank you for having me as a guest on your show. Uh, I really appreciate the dialogue. I learned from that. Um, I've learned a lot again today uh, because I think that is, I told you that already. It's something that where I um, evolve and grow is when I have these conversations with uh, smart people like you. And uh, and I love following your shows and I love following what you actually publish and write about. So thank you very much for having me here. Um, I can only say, you know, at the end, when I was talking about the whole presence and I'm going into these big, big layers or these big dimensions, there's also something very tangible and something very everyday we can do. I mean, I I host these series every few months to journey to the future and invite thought leaders and decision makers and thinkers and and debaters um, onto the show to discuss some of those challenges. And uh, the last one was around decarbonization and sustainability. And I had uh, Lubomila Jonanova on on the show. She's uh, um, an Obama leader for Europe and the founder of Plan A here in Berlin. Uh, and they work on decarbonization strategies. And I just, what I love, for instance, what she what she does is that, you know, she constantly publishes jobs in the space of sustainability. So she really goes, she, you know, cracks that down into something very tangible to say, okay, how can you get engaged into, you know, designing, co-designing a desirable future? These are the jobs in the space of sustainability and these startups and these companies apply for them. Yeah. And a lot of people are, you know, they are really working on some very tangible everyday things, how you can actually improve your carbon footprint, how you can um, access certain information, how you can actually qualify yourself with a specific course to deep dive. Yeah. Do you can actually then uh, attend an event and get to know somebody? Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, that's how, for instance, I got to know you being part of the faculty of Future IO is, to, you know, to, to build these kind of networks. And I think that is one important thing is surround yourself with people that that you admire, that you look up to, that you learn from. I mean, um, and there's no there's no problem in asking. I mean, if somebody doesn't have the time to to have that conversation with you, then ask the next person. Uh, just move on, and you, you'll have these conversations eventually. And uh, and that's what I think is something very much I look forward to is these very very tangible steps moving forward. Yeah, so. In that sense, um, I think there's a lot that we can talk about. This has been a very, very short while uh, with you, um, as always, and look forward to our next conversation. Thanks so much, Pascal. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes, take care. Bye-bye.